Welcome back, Red Spotters. Another show here on Red Spotlight. I'm Alexis Soto, and I'm joined today by David Francisco for our second installment of what we are like to call Beyond the Shield. Is that what we're calling this thing? Uh, this is our show where we talk about the final season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. This is our weekly recap series. We're back here for episode two, titled Know Your Onions. Um, David, how are you doing? Good. How was the week like for you? Same. Work <laughs> and <laughs> just trying to watch whatever I can. Yeah, that's it, it, it's at a point where it's kind of the same feeling almost every week. You're just kind of going through the motions and you're doing what you can. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe not necessarily what you like because of the conditions that we're in. Um, although I think we can share a little bit more in common this week because I know that, um, you know, in almost every podcast that we had and we mentioned, um, COVID-19, um, Alexis Moreno always would say that I feel bad for you guys because it's getting like really bad in the Imperial Valley. And by, believe me, we've kind of, um, had a spike in cases by, oh my God, literally over a thousand cases in the span Mm -hmm. of a week, um, confirmed of COVID-19 here. Um, at the same time, though, um, things ain't looking good in your neck of the woods, from what I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I actually don't pay attention much to like what's happening here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, I mean, overall I in Arizona, things are not necessarily going in the in the right path. Mm-hmm. From what I've well, seen, I mean, yeah. I know I've been noticing at work more people not wearing masks, mm-hmm. and so that's kind of annoying. Uh, You're not the only one, man. I, I've I've been noticing that trend frustratingly too. Um, you know, last week I kind of snapped, and I just like decided, you know what? I need to get the fuck out of this house. I can't anymore. I just can't. So I mm-hmm. I just went every now and then when I get that way, I go on a little cruise just in my car, have music yeah. going, and just so I can drive, just so I can say and feel as if I'm not trapped in the house and everything. And the number of people that have been wearing masks, especially the people who are outside, as that's what I see when I'm on on a drive, is I think the most positive thing I could say about that is worrying, which is not a positive word whatsoever. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the kindest thing I can say is that it's worrying. Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what I can do. So, just gotta go with it. Yeah, yeah, it just seems that way. So this week, episode two, Know Your Onions. Uh, It's interesting, while watching this episode, and I seemingly forget, and I have to re-learn this thing every single year, and this doesn't speak to um, any kind of disappointment in the episode. Um, It just, it's, not at all. It, It speaks to how, in many ways how this series has been structured really ever since going back to the beginning of season two. And that is, and I assume it's not like it's unique to them, but it it has become a trend with them. Wherein the, and and in some seasons it's more explicit than others where like the second episode of the season is really just a second part of the first episode, like a two parter version of doctor who basically. And in some seasons it may not be as overt as that. Like I think of season six or season uh, four, maybe there were a little bit uh, more like individual episodes, but in seasons like two and five and, and definitely here, Uh, The second episode operates basically like um, the second half of episode one, which makes it feel more like, you know, I think the length of a feature film, basically. Um, So, I mean, you you have it in point by a lot of these characters having, um, you know, yeah, it takes place literally moments after last week. um, And it continues on. And we're introduced to a lot more how shall i say this plot lines that are going on this season were introduced to new um character arcs um yeah and it's been interesting to see the response by the the fan base on this in terms of um the kind of decisions they were making with the characters but i think it's it's clear um going on a broad level 
that this episode introduced the story arcs that we're going to be looking at through the rest of the season. Which, you know, in general, I really do appreciate because it, it, it always brings it back to character um, with this show. And it does illustrate to me that they're always concerned about um, making sure that every person, every character, every main character in this series has something worthwhile to do and has a road to go through every single year. And doing it for seven years, that's not exactly easy. It can you know, get tired. It can, you know, go through the motions, but, uh, it's really interesting to see where it's going to go. I want to go off with you then, David, tell me, um, overall what this episode left you feeling. Uh, no, I mean, you, you basically said it. this was really just set up for a bunch of character arcs and just adding a bit more plot to some stuff. Uh, I just, um, trying to remember exactly what happened no i mean they just set up some really cool stuff i like daisy's little um i guess like almost trying to take over mm. type of thing type yeah. of plot and uh pat and oswald's still the best thing <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it really was like the best in this episode it was cool um and yeah, this is like I said. Like you said, this is like part two of a uh, uh, of the episode. Yeah, and I think um, if it wasn't clear, I think overall it was generally a good episode. Um, oh yeah, yeah, not not necessarily great or the best, but good, good follow up. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's we're really we're still really at the beginning mm -hmm. um, of all of this. And I mean, if they're gonna be as fun as this, hell yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're gonna it's be also, in, yeah. It's also just a good um, slow build yeah. to the ending, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, uh, who knows what's going to happen next. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, anything, I think, is on the table when it comes to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. If that's, um, if the past is any kind of indication. <laughs> um, just uh, as far as like what um, this episode was a big the big presence that we got in this episode um, broadly, and we'll go into the individual moments with more detail, but I thought it was a great showcase for why um, Joel Stoffer is just a great, great character as Enoch. I love no, Enoch. Yes. And um, there was a moment in this episode, which we'll get into a bit later that I think um, made my heart sink. And it just made me <laughs> like, um, it's just made me aware much more of how mu how far we've come with this character. Think about like, um, and the same with Deke though. Deke is although Deke got some big moments last year, and he, you felt mm -hmm. that his character really arrived last year. But with Enoch, you know, both Enoch and Deke were introduced to us pretty late in the game, oh, yeah. like like the beginning of season five. And to think like how far they've come as characters, um, and how much they've meant to um the team is pretty cool i love it and i love that character and he never fails to make me laugh like out loud like some of the biggest laughs i think from this episode have come from enoch especially the interactions from another treasure of the series pat Oswalt. <laughs> you know uh, uh yeah go ahead no yeah, i was agreeing with you I was like well this episode for enoch uh What'd you say? Like you, you made your, your heart sink or yeah. something. I felt the exact same way. I literally almost screamed. Like, are you kidding me? And uh, Deke did have like a really cool moment in this. Yes, um, kind of sad, but also it was, it was cool. an important moment for him to have as well. Um, because yes. he's not been put in a position like that at all. And I was a little concerned about whether or not he was gonna do it because that would be really out of character. He's not that at all so i'm glad that it, mm -hmm. that it was brought back at the last minute because sometimes you know you don't want to i've been burned a lot re in, in recent years by what can be called character assassin ex <laughs> character assassination, assassination in different kind of programs so um i'm glad that um that didn't necessarily happen as how it was being built up that too but it was a good moment for him as well um Daisy is 
a little bit more complicated because um, it's one of those things where, like, on some level, we need to reassert ourselves as the audience and not put our personal perspectives and logic into the character. Um, because I've noticed that it's been a little, that's been the hot topic of the last week was Daisy going all, um, basically in, in, in almost complete contradiction to what they all agreed to last week, which was to, you know, ripples, not waves, that whole thing of time travel. But again, mm -hmm. a classic trope of time travel is the yeah. characters trying to fix things. And of course they ended up creating which, you know, it can feel a little derivative of, you know, the ending of season five, which was how they were, they were trying to change the future. And ultimately they ended up creating it because of that. So mm -hmm. I understand that that's an issue there for those that want to see it. It's interesting because on, I, I do buy it because the girl has always been so fucking impulsive. <laughs> and yeah. I can only imagine though that we'll look at the intentions it's not just the fact that she can save thousands of lives and you know avert the whole hydra thing but in my mind i'm thinking that she just goes back to well if if malik is never really a presence personally what does that mean for the future of lincoln because malik was the one that pursued and brought back hive and it was malik yeah. that instigated you know Fitz and Simmons opening the portal again to bring back Hive. And if that didn't necessarily occur, Lincoln might not have died. Mm -hmm. And she, and I don't know, it's been years and years, but like, again, I think she said it as recently as late season five to Deke, she's still not over him. So, yeah. and this being, of course, the last season, like, I'm sure that was kind of what was on the top of her mind. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, she she's the main character of the show so like whatever happens with hydra it affected her the most oh, like, her forget the about most. that I mean, her parents do <laughs> her parents that. Yeah. yeah but i mean i mean even though like yeah all the other characters were affected by what hydra have done you know hers like she in the beginning she thought she had a family she thought she had like a great future ahead of her but then hydra happens and it just kind of like goes down the drain and just keeps leading up to like more and more trouble for her mm -hmm. and even though I'm sure she loves the friends and family that she made, you know, things, who knows what could have happened if Hydra was never created again. So I think for her, it, yeah. it makes total sense that she wants She's to. She's just been through a tremendous amount of loss. And I feel that sometimes we don't do enough thinking on that because mm -hmm. you think that, and she's been through a long road and journey on this series through these seven seasons, but you are right. I, I, I Hydra basically like, it was an allegory, I guess, for rape and murder, basically that whole thing with her mother, um, mm. basically stealing her in human powers and then dumping off the pieces of her. And then, of course, that's what drove her dad insane. And then, of course, that's what made her mom evil. And then this here and that there. It's like literally Daisy's entire life has mm -hmm. been shaped and molded by Hydra. Um, I hope they bring that up somehow i I really do and i i think we're gonna get some moments here because we didn't really get any kind of resolution to that that particular moment uh with daisy yeah. so i would assume that um that's why colson's there and i would hope that they're they're gonna talk it through and make sure that she's okay because um she did go pretty rambo on that like she well like going off the reservation like she's like okay um she really went out of her way to like not even bothered talking to colson or even mm -hmm. mac uh it was like deke in some ways like she kind of really emotionally manipulated deke to like basically do her bidding um now i don't know if she's caught on because it doesn't seem as if the show has made that clear if she's caught on that like he's always had a thing for her and still does and that she used that against him um because she's never addressed it to anyone mm -hmm. Even when, like, Deke was trying to, like, you know, um, show his affection for her with lemons in her bunk uh, a few seasons ago, she was, like, so focused on other things. And I think he backed yeah. off after the whole mention of Lincoln. But I've never really been clear if she's aware of that. And so when she tells Deke, 
by the way, Deke, of course, the experienced time traveler here and in, in mm-hmm. talking about the whole multiverse theory and ripples, not waves, is so convinced by her testimony, I guess, um, that this guy needs to go because of all of the blood he's going to spill. And mm-hmm. that puts Deke in a position. And we're talking about the Wilfred Malik, the the young character of um, Gideon Malik, who is a future villain of uh, the series uh, back in season three. It puts Deke in a very, by the way, spoilers here from now on. I apologize. We're just going to go into it because like, it's hard um, and it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's just a small part of the episode. Of course. I think Deke is put in a position to uh, kill someone. And, you know, that's not something Deke's ever done, at least mm-hmm. to my recollection. I mean, no. he's uh, proven himself several times, and maybe he helped to take out a few Kree. I can't recall. But um, he's not a murderer. And I don't think he's been put to the test because um, he's be- relatively pr- practically a, a new agent. Um, he practically got a promotion from like um, annoyance to agent at the <laughs> end of last season um, from the director. And um, I'm glad that he's that I'm glad that Deke and Mac got to spend as much time as they're getting because, you know, like there's so much that this is doing. Right. Like um, I really was hesitant a little bit when they announced that Mac would be the new director at the end of season five. But the more and more that I've seen of Mac as a director, the more at ease I am with him, you know, the more like confidence I have with him. And I love the fact that he got to spend this much time with Deke, who is the new guy basically. And like, you know, having these, these moments, uh, basically Mm -hmm. like, like a mentor and mentee kind of moment. I'm glad that Mac has become, that kind of a presence for Deke um, in the absence of Fitz, especially and um, in moments, Gemma. So I love that dynamic and I'm glad that it was Mac that talked him down. Um, And again, like Mac, like I give the orders. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. (laughs) It was like, Hey, what the hell? (laughs) Like (laughs) You're under orders. I give the orders, Deke. What the fuck? You can't like Mm -hmm. just do that. Um, But of course, you know, appealing to his better um, nature, because Deke is a good guy, and he yeah. wouldn't necessarily do that. At least, and I think even Patton Oswalt says it at, um, at some point in the episode. You can't like punish some somebody for something they ain't done yet. There's um the whole film uh, with this premise called Minority Report by Steven Spielberg, which stars Tom Cruise um, and Max von Sydow. Brilliant movie. It's on Netflix if you want to see it. But it has an amazing concept where. Um, People are arrested for crimes they haven't committed yet because of the ability to see into the future. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I I actually loved the idea of Mac being director from the very beginning. He's always been, like, the kindest person, like, almost as kind as Coulson to mm-hmm. the team. Knows how to, like, ease tension between them, but also just kind of, like, he, he does it, um, know how to process certain situations and just like kind of, but as a director it's kind of, it's still kind of hard for him to like come up with the decision mm. but then when he needs to be like the tough guy like that's him that's definitely him yeah so i i think he i always love that idea and and i and i do like the dynamic it's almost the dynamic between mac and deke it's almost like how he was with um fitz or yes when uh when his brain yes was all messed up so <laughs> i think he is like he is he's the big brother to the yeah. entire team basically so uh, i think they just kind of want to bring that dy- dynamic back into the show i'm so glad really like. you brought that up and i wasn't even thinking to that but what you just <laughs> said makes so much sense um and you know it, it's it's crazy because like you know He's always been the the moral compass of, um, which is always like a, a his faith um, has been has been a big part of the series. Um, like one of the only characters that has like a big like faith in him, or that mm-hmm. believes in faith basically has faith in in a power higher than himself, and it guides his moral compass for sure. And that's always been on display. His entire. Um, presence is of that and he's always been not only a team builder but a team leader and in some ways 
you know, you having like put that into perspective of the relationship with like him and Fitz and then with others, like with Daisy and Hunter and other characters on the, sh on the show, it, it probably didn't happen. It wasn't by design, but looking back on the, on the earlier seasons, especially when he was first brought on the scene in season two, who, by the way, forget he was kind of a double agent <laughs> um, <laughs> in the first season. Um, and he was very, very like at odds with Coulson and a lot of the stuff, which has brought a different like dynamic with him. But in like the later seasons, especially when like when Coulson would go off the reservation, as he would say, and like put Mac in charge, um, you could almost say like, yeah, the show was always building to Mac being the successor. And it, it mm -hmm. always did give plenty of moments where Mac was um, a terrific leader. And I think we're seeing it on display. Um, although, um, in these two episodes, uh, I would probably want to make sure everybody's okay because, um, you know, Daisy's doing some stuff. I don't know what the fuck is happening with May. <laughs> that, that needs to be, <laughs> oh my somebody God. needs to address that situation because holy shit. And mm. then of course, Yo-Yo really needs some help. Um, so there's, um, yeah. a couple of loose and then Simmons is really not okay i mean it's not just fits but some shit has happened with her and there's a lot of like problems that these characters are all, like going through but we're not at the point where we're like addressing them or talking about them head on we're only getting teases to that but um yeah was, i think we need an emotional counselor brought on <laughs> to the team because there's a lot of crap going on here um i yeah. think what's happening to all of them is Basically, what happened with Fitz, um, I think, last season, when mm. he saw his um, evil self, uh -huh. that illusion, where it's like, it's been building up to this. And I think that's what's happening with them now. And, and for at some sure, point, you think... Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. And I think for sure that's what's happening with May. I don't know. I mean, it could be the... Um, what was that alien thing? Uh, sh the shrike? shrike? Yeah, it could be that. But I don't know. I think it, it could also be just like, everything that's happened uh to her that she's kind of almost done i mean like she wants i to guess get the you mission could say done. that everybody just they finally snapped <laughs> it only took seven <laughs> years but like that's it we're just off the yeah. deep end like i mean I, you know considering what they've been through i don't blame them <laughs> mm -hmm. like that's a lot of like emotional abuse um, on top of just like the complete, you know, wackadoodle nature of like, oh, the, okay, I guess we're we're time traveling now. We we just finished, you know, de defeating this demon from a spirit world that wanted to inhabit the bodies of every known person and everything, <laughs> and now we're off in 1931 and we're going off against hmm. aliens. No, I mean, <clears throat> it, it was May's reaction at the end uh, when she sees Coulson mm -hmm. and he's like, hey, I was dead, but I'm back. And she's like, you're still dead. And it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Where it's like, to me, that that was kind of like my proof that she's kind of done with everything. She wants to protect them. She wants to get whatever's mission going on done. But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she seemed pretty done. Like, fuck this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, and it, was, and it was delivered in such a cold way. I mean, she was cold in general this episode. Um, mm -hmm. But that moment, especially when like uh, Coulson was like, I was dead. And like you still are drops the damn like car like uh uh thing that she had uh I think it was a car bro or crowbar she had a crowbar that she was beating up Enoch with she drops oh. it and then she just like walks off I mean that was pretty cold um yeah. for that shit to happen and like not at all what I am sure um the Felinda fans I'm sure would have wanted for but it also brings in the question like. It is, I don't think it's a situation where a, an entity from the spirit dimension that she just came from is inhabiting her body. There are some fans out there that think that some remnant of Izel, uh or Shrike is like possessing her. I don't think that's clearly not what's going on. Otherwise, like that she would just go on a rampage. Um, another theory which I'm not necessarily sure is what I would want to happen because it's it's happened literally before with this character, 
is that she's been swapped um, by the Chronicons um, and implanted there as an LMD, which literally is what happened in season four. So I'm not sure we want to repeat that. Um, but she does in some ways operate like a Chronicon where it's she's <clears throat> showing kind of no emotion. Um, I do think there is something to be said about what you think, and that is she is at the point where it's just like it's done. And it it, it should be also made clear, be made clear, that Enoch said specifically that you died, May, but you were dead for just like a little amount of time where we can bring you back and we repaired you and everything. Now, my mind goes to, did something go wrong, Enoch? Um, when you were fixing her up, um, did you forget to put her emotions back in her mind? Um, and at the same time, oh yeah, like she died again. Because <laughs> I mean, she died briefly when they shut off her brain back in season four. Um, in the um, the episode where um, all of the power outages were happening because of uh, the watchdogs and everything. That's a throwback. That's a long mm. time from here. Um, sure. But it, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I can't mm -hmm. think that she's just like completely shutting down because we've seen her so many times, like being able to put that aside and, you know, for it. Um, I think there is something else at play that has yet to reveal itself, but I don't think it's a situation where she's been switched out. I mm. think this is May, but there's something different about her now it could be um her soul maybe not there and they'll bring back ghost rider for this season <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i mean i wish but i mean i'm not counting on that um yeah no but at the same time though like i don't think they're gonna sh um show any big twists in this season because mm. the twists are, are always going to be that Okay, why? What are they doing in this? Uh, the Chronicoms doing in this time? What are they gonna change? And so you're gonna keep getting twists of like, oh, we right, thought this was gonna be the plan, but no, it's this. And so, I don't think they're gonna show any big twists into this show. I think that we're just gonna see progress within um their psyche of this mm -hmm. whole entire situation, and we're just gonna kind of process it one by one. You know, I agree with you so, in that. Um... And what you point out is that a lot of the problems and a lot of the character arcs that have been seemingly set up in this episode are are coming exclusively from a psychological point of view. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the situation with May or Daisy or Gemma or um, Yo-Yo, um, it's not like in other seasons where like Yo-Yo had her arms cut off or um, May was incap incapacitated because of her knee and shit like that. So it's a lot less physical and a lot more emotional and, and psychologically driven, mm -hmm. um, which I prefer. And it's interesting and it doesn't, you know, um, I think there are some corners of the fandom that would have, and I think this is true of all fandoms where we would have be, we would have just like forget what the arcs and let's just go with the characters as they are and go from there. I understand that. Um, but again, like, I don't know where these arcs are going. I think we're, mm. we're going to get, obviously, to a point of resolution. And I think it's going to make the team stronger than they ever have been to defeat the Chronicles and everything. Um, but uh, we need to, and this is especially harder for television seasons, we need to wait for the storyline to unveil itself. Um, yeah. before we're able to really um, cast judgment on it. Um, and it can go one way or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll say with Doctor Who, it was building toward a big, big arc, but it ended up being more of a revelation, not really an arc, mm -hmm. that the whole season was building up to. So differences different examples of course but i would i would always caution people especially when it comes to television seasons to um yeah review as you go but always make sure to to clarify that we don't have the whole puzzle yet so mm. we're only operating on what we're given so like l l let's talk about some of those examples 
they they don't want to tell us yet how much time has passed um since Simmons has seen any of them Simmons and, and Enoch because Simmons mm-hmm. is asked by Daisy in episode one how long have we not seen each other and she says a long time and then in this episode May asks Enoch how much time and then Enoch responds with a long time they are being very vague and intentionally vague about that they really didn't say no i could have sworn no. they no. have no, i they... thought i had it in my mind that she was gone for three years no what the heck where did i get three years from <laughs> i don't know <laughs> <That's> weird <laughs> I mean, this I year I, has felt like three years, so maybe that's where it came from. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I could have sworn they said that she was gone for three years or something. I don't know. That was no, weird. no, no. Two times they, they reiterated to be intentionally vague with how many years, which leads me to believe that's going to come back up and revealed um, in some manner, maybe when I think we get Fitz back. I would assume mm. that's when we're going to get that kind of resolution. Um, yeah, Maybe. Yeah. Um, so with Yo-Yo, the big thing that's set up with her is that she is not sure what is causing her powers to not necessarily work. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's... I think we're going to go with the, with, with the route that... Well, I, don't even, I don't even know. I don't think yeah, her same. powers... <laughs> I don't think her powers are like... Like somebody turned the 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 off switch on them but i think that she's having an internal struggle to i don't know like is she like can she use them is she like afraid to use them like i don't know what's going on there i think she can use them because you saw the bottle falling in slow motion and i thought that was like indication that her powers activated but for some reason she was hesitant to catch it yeah yeah i mean i think maybe it could be as simple as, although Simmons made it clear to her that her new arms would are much more enhanced, advanced, and uh, equipped with handling her inhuman powers. Mm-hmm. And it could be as simple as, well, last time I got new arms and I used them in the field, they fucking hurt like a bitch. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe she just had like ref- like reflex from that. Uh, it was a reflex reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, or it, it, it could be something much more, um, let's just say affecting like the fact that she almost died and yeah. she seemed to have a very like emotional reaction to that in the last episode. So it could be that she's, I don't know, maybe coming to terms with her mortality a little bit more and maybe she's reevaluating, which is what yeah. also, um, Coulson said to Mac in the beginning of last episode, like, I'll help you. We'll get through this. But after that, I want to reevaluate. I want to know what I want. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, we could be coming to a head with all of our characters in that kind of um, way. We're Mm -hmm. we're kind of getting to a point where what what do what do I want versus what the job demands of me? Basically, is this what I Mm -hmm. want for the rest of my life? Maybe it could be that. I'm not sure, though. I mean, uh, maybe she wasn't exactly hesitant to, like, stop the bottle. But you know how her powers, she explained that, like, she can go as like as far and as fast as a heartbeat. Right. And maybe she kind of got scared in the situation. So, mm-hmm. like, the heartbeat was just quick, <laughs> intense. Yeah, I think her her demeanor this episode uh, by Natalia Cordova, amazing actor um, mm-hmm. with this character. I think her demeanor screams of her being a little bit insecure. I think the most insecure. She's she's very nervous, it seems like. Yeah. So there's something there. Although what it is, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think hers is really the most vague in situation. There have been some crazy... Can... Th- I'm sorry, David, go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say there have been some crazy theories about Simmons in that um, so much time has passed that she's a chronic calm herself. <laughs> that could be. I mean... <laughs> I, mean, I mentioned a couple of people, a couple of podcasts mentioned this, and it's like, well, I mean, it wouldn't be out of left field. It, it, 
if they're being vague with the details, it could be something like that. Um, that could explain a little bit as to why she's been a little cold. Um, mm. I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. I don't want every character to like be switched out with a Carnicom or LMD. I feel that's like a little bit done, but that would be a hell of a revelation. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's uh, Simmons. I, I I do think that's that's really just her problem that she's been alone with just uh, with um, what's his name? Enoch. Enoch. Uh, for like a long time, so she kind of just feels distant from everyone. They don't know what she's been through, so she just kind of doesn't know how to deal with it. I think I think that's just pretty much it. I think we'll see her slowly. Um. Uh, come back with the team right so i really go ahead go ahead uh no i was just uh you go ahead <laughs> i'm sorry i don't mean to cut you off i was just like training off onto the next thought <clears throat> yeah same <laughs> for the episode um there were, uh, there's a bunch of things that i was thinking uh, of yeah. that were in parallel with um other other kind of pop culture references but let's let's hop on to um Pat Oswalt here um is Koenig who is you know, it's interesting cuz in the first episode um we're kind of led to believe he's very much um maybe a little bit more morally gray um than the Koenigs that we know of in the future um but this episode really does uh show that no this is a good guy uh he goes really far out of his way for freddy um yeah a lot more than i think he realized he should have considering how that ended up like mm -hmm. backfiring in his face completely um no but Patton oswald is great in everything and anything and him as a koenig has always been amazing comedic relief um, they give him great lines to work off with. Of course, the title of the episode comes from when he's talking to Simmons about knowing her onions and how <laughs> she was like discovering, which this is also another point we can talk about. The super soldier ser uh, serum, the earlier um, versions of what would be uh, the serum that Erskine developed and that Johann Schmidt stole. And if you know those names and you're aware of, the MCU film, the Captain America, the first Avenger. Um, We're back to the references. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is interesting, though. Um, we're going to get a lot of those, I would assume, because oh, yeah. we're, we're delving with the history of not just S.H.I.E.L.D. and S.H.I.E.L.D. history is inherent with MCU history. And we're already like in this episode, we're having like two different examples of like S.H.I.E.L.D. history where we have the mythology of the S.H.I.E.L.D. universe with um, the Malik family. And then, of course, with the Super Soldier Serum with Captain America and the MCU version of, of Hydra. So a lot of marrying going on with this. And mm -hmm. there was um, a particular moment. I think it was a few weeks back when uh, the first episode, The New Deal, um, aired on Wednesday. I mentioned that the whole cast and crew had a Zoom call with um, on ABC, which was hosted by uh, Screen Junkies, Eric Goldman. And they always get asked this question, and I feel so bad for them because, like, they never really have a good answer because they can't have a good answer to like the whole tying it in and like, I, I, I wish that like, you know, like, yeah, the show was sold on the premise of it being the tie-in show, mm -hmm. but I feel like enough like reporters understand that the show was never given the opportunity to be that at its full potential, yeah, and they're using the Disney Plus shows for that. And they, they're aware of the split between Marvel Entertainment and Marvel Studio, like Perlmutter and Kevin Feige. They know that whole story and, and the divergence after season two or three of that. So, And after that point, the show really hasn't bothered to do too much tying in because why would you? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, at a certain point, it's, the movies don't give a shit about you. Why should you give a shit about them? You know, and <laughs> I mean, it, it's like people were so up in arms about like Jed Whedon and Marissa Tancherone and not, you know, having season six take place during the timeline a year after infinity war, but, 
But at that point, the snap happened. But in in the show, the snap never happened. Now, of mm. course, there are a whole bunch of like convoluted time reasons why that didn't occur. Like I think I would accept, you know, by the premise of the show. But of course, we know that happened because Kevin Feige couldn't be bothered to tell them that hey, um, and like uh, there's a five year gap between Infinity War and Endgame. And we can't risk, and we can't risk you airing um, your show sometime before the release of Infinity War, or Endgame. I think no, for Endgame, for 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 that to give away the ending, which ended up being in the summer afterwards. So that wasn't mm-hmm. a big deal. The point is, like, I feel so bad yeah, <laughs> for them same. because like, <laughs> there's no winning. There's just no mm-hmm. winning, and especially because they keep getting asked these questions. But they were asked, and they did say. That we would be bumping into something big, um, with a reference mm-hmm. to the MCU, and we know that. Um, I've seen previews of like later on in the season where the Triskelion comes back and the Chronicoms blow it up and shit like that. So, and I mean, we're getting a whole bunch of tie-ins. I know that in in this coming week, we're going to get an episode with Daniel Souza, which is Agent Carter's partner on the Agent Carter show. Uh, he was in the previews. Oh, so, really? I, yeah. I don't watch some of the previews. Oh, so. I'm sorry. If you want me to no, not fine. mention no, that. No, no, uh, it's, okay. it's, it, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll sure I'll watch it at some point, some of them, but I don't know. But who cares? Yeah, I was, but, I, no, I, that's awesome. Yeah. That's I, so cool. I feel like I have to because, like, you know, um, you and I, I mean, I'll tell you from my experience. I've watched this series from the beginning, back in 2013, mm-hmm. on TV, always on primetime TV. And at the end of every episode, after the credits... They would have like a 30 second like trailer for next week's episode. So I'm just so used to watching yeah. that to get me like, you know, mm-hmm. through the week of waiting for the next episode. But yeah, Daniel Souza and that's a whole Agent Carter tie in there. So um, I guess you could say season seven uh, comes back to the whole like tie in um, premise a little bit uh, for those that yeah. want that. And I'm. Would it be in the last season? I mean, duh. I mean, do it. That's what Endgame <laughs> yeah. did pretty much. So, I mean, that's what <laughs> that's why you use time travel to kind mm-hmm. of like go back with all of these wonderful storylines. So that being said, though, I don't know. And I, I don't, I don't want to promise. And I don't want to like get my hopes up too much that they're going to um, address the snap per se. I will um, for the record and for those. And, and I think, you know, I... I go out of my way to really read a lot of interviews with them. I know last, I think it was last year. Um, in fact, no, it was two years ago. <laughs> I think it was, um, I think it was around comic con when the team was, you know what? I can't even, yeah, it was around comic con and the team was, um, Promoting season six, which would come back a year after, coincidentally. But they were asked about whether or not the show is going to address the snap. And you know what? At just this instant, I can't recall if that was 2018 or 2019 Comic-Con. But it was one of those. And I think it was Kevin Smith or somebody might have asked him or whatever. There's too many in my pictures in my mind to recall what it was. But Jed Whedon did say... And he was specifically referring to season seven, that the snap or or where the team are in the timeline would be addressed in some way. Mm-hmm. So whatever it is, if that's mm-hmm. all you care about, if that's what you really want to know. And yeah, I, th- that'd be interesting to know how exactly this fits in and everything. But um, I think what David and I always want to stress is we've really stopped caring about the whole tie-in thing like years ago. And it's like, it's no longer something that we feel is fair to judge the quality of the series because of the circumstances and because pretty putting it bluntly, how far improved the series has been since not giving a damn about what the show is doing. Like I think one of, in hindsight, you could really argue that some of the forced tie-ins were a bit awkward um that thor ragnarok not thor ragnarok that thor the dark world one was always hilarious to me (laughs) just (laughs) cleaning up the damn trash (laughs) that's what they were reduced to and then in season two um reyna because she was a clairvoyant um ha i love that twist though of course we never addressed the she was the clairvoyant after all 
um, with her inhuman powers. The clairvoyant was a big part of, of season one, remember? The clairvoyant was this big, the first big villain of the series, but ended up being John Garrett um, as Hydra. Go back mm. and you'll see. And then her powers ended up being that she, she could see the future. Okay. Um, and there was this weird moment. Um, well, I guess it, it's not so weird, but like there was this um, episode in season two called The Dirty Half Dozen where you get back the original team members and they go to the uh, Arctic and they blow up a base and they rescue Deathlock and Lincoln from Hydra. Um, and then Coulson steals Loki's staff back from, well, not, no, he, he gets the location of Loki's staff. And then he talks to Kobe Smulders, Maria Hill. And then he tells her, uh, time to get the Avengers ready. And then there's a tag. The post credit scene for that episode has Reyna seeing Ultron destroy all the cities in Sokovia. And then of course that week, Age of Ultron comes out in theaters. Mm, so yeah, no, I think I missed that part actually when that episode aired. I didn't really? see that part where he said uh, we have to get the Avengers back. I uh -huh. can't remember how, when I actually saw it, but when, when the episode aired, I didn't see that. But I did see the next episode mm -hmm. where you see the the aftermath. The, the no, the helicarrier. You remember? That's right. Yes, they had a protocol. Was, yeah, mm -hmm. that was, that actually uh, I really like that reference. Mm -hmm. And didn't that one chick, uh, the can see the future? Didn't she like saw a vision where she saw like metal men? That's exactly what so, I was talking about. Reyna yeah, was yeah. having a vision about metal men destroying cities. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I, I did like the Infinity War tie-in where they were like, did you know there's ships like flying over New York or something like that? <laughs> that was... I mean, I, I yes. There was also... It was, just, it was just kind of cool like seeing like, oh, this is happening exactly when uh, Thanos is doing his thing. I thought that was... I think that was like the best tie-in. <laughs> I love it. And there was, I mean, there was also more, a little bit more to it. Um, Tarion Kasaias name dropped Thanos' name when he was talking to Graviton. Um, That's right. So there's, they do some fun tie-ins and they mm -hmm. really go out of their way to do it. But unfortunately for them, like, it's like a scorned lover situation. Kevin Feige never, ever, ever wants to like reciprocate that love and never will, it seems like. So... Um, but it's still impressive to me that they're, they're able to do it really organically with it. And I think they're, they'll, cause to me, what I've always suspected is that, okay, well, fuck Kevin Feige fucked us. So what can we say about season six? Well, we can say that because the shield agents were in a time loop, at least this is what I would do. They were in a time loop. They broke the time loop and they diverged off in a different timeline where they were no longer with the MCU and how we get them back. It's time travel. I don't know. I guess. <laughs> that, I mean, that time, can work. Time travel always fixes everything. So that's kind maybe of... in the last season they weren't in a universe where the snap happened. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when they fucked up the timeline, yeah, why not? Well, they were already um, in that situation because the time loop itself, the time loop itself prevent and and the cat and the catastrophe of of the Earth splitting in half prevented th that from happening because mm -hmm. from what i understand um the battle of wakanda happened i think a few hours later um yeah it must have like a few hours later or around the same time that uh the battle of chicago was happening with daisy and graviton now in the in the original prophecy where the earth cracked in two Graviton absorbed Daisy and her powers and he destroyed everybody and himself because he can't breathe in space by taking out the Gravitonium from the planet's uh, inner core and blowing everything up, which means the Avengers died, Wakanda was destroyed, mm -hmm. and Thanos never got the stones that he needed to do the snap. That's so in, the, in that timeline, still, the snap couldn't have happened because the earth cracked like an egg. And then when the shield team, yeah, go ahead. What if the common cons go back in time to where, uh, uh, graviton was created and stop him from being created. And then that's how they come back to the infinity war timeline. That could be it too. That um, could be it. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of things that we don't even know what they're going after. I think, um, the common cons are not like, it, maybe they're, well, they will be among the least interesting villains because there are just a bunch of robots that feel nothing. But mm -hmm. what, 
keeps them at an advantage is that we don't we don't know their targets. I think we can suspect that they're going to be going after like some familiar faces, but we don't know what exactly they're going to go after and how it's going to tie back into the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of intrigue going on in there. Um, and it is fun to speculate like how we can get the team back in the MC. <laughs> yes, it's really fun. It's confusing, but fun. Yeah. No. And uh, also, the thing they can just do, honestly, is just like finish this mission. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, you know what? We're all going to retire now, blah, blah, blah. And they just do a five year, t- um, uh, go forward five years. And so then now you can just keep it as a hint. It's like, did the snap happen? Did it happen? Are they. Um, yeah. Who knows? Just keep it vague <laughs> yeah it. and you know what I, I i do think it is foolish of disney and kevin feige not considering doing um an agents of sword television series for disney plus an agents of sword would be literally what you wanted agents of shield to be from the beginning but with the budget that <laughs> you would love to do it and Probably even more because this would feature sword being in space. It's the shield in space, and this would deal with a lot of aliens. Um, what I would do is like, hey, bring back Jed and Marissa. They're good at this kind of genre stuff. It'll be a wonderful sequel series, but you don't have to include any of the characters from Shield. You can have a different like version with like Fury and in Hill out in space with Talos. And the, uh, what do they call the scrolls and everything? Mm-hmm. You can bring back Daisy if you want, or some other characters um, to bring, you know, to establish a connection, which, you know, shows like Korra and Rebels do with the previous um, series. So I th- I think there's too much that would work there to like not do it. I know they're not going to do that. Um, there have been some rumors that that's what's been discussed, but I feel like that would be kind of a big deal if you do it Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. but you know how how often we get what we want (laughs) which is not at all um yeah yes uh let's talk about enoch yes it is a big week for enoch (laughs) (laughs) can he get a break okay no (laughs) Oh my god! So like last season, like he, he was just getting a bunch of shit from uh, Fitz. You know, he's all like, "You're annoying me," blah blah blah. And I felt kind of bad for him on that because yeah. he doesn't know who he doesn't know. And then this one, like you kind of see, you know, I think this Simmons does really care about him. You know, because they've been together who knows how long. And then he just gets left behind. <laughs> And it's just like his face though like i can't tell if he's like sad or he's just kind of like oh well he's like i tend to do the next thing but i felt so bad for him <laughs> yeah yeah i mean at the same time it's also hilarious because of the reaction and shit like that but um i mean the good the positive side to this and i, and I hope they they deduce this because in this in the next week they're going to travel i think a few decades later into the future if we're going to take anything good from this is Enoch doesn't age. Mm-hmm. And so it it can be as simple as like, you know how the doctor does this sometimes he goes a long way around. Um, he just waits <laughs> yeah. for them to reappear in a different like timeline. Yeah, no, I know. I know they get him back like that. I just kind of like, they all better hug him or something when they <laughs> see him and apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Just that's all I want. <laughs> At the same time, though, the pairing of Enoch and Koenig and that version of Koenig, wow, there yes. was so much meta ness going on there. Um, <laughs> no pun intended, obviously, but um, just like from okay, one of the best moments I think of any Shield moment ever was to have Koenig, nineteen thirty one Koenig. They bring him to the to the Zephyr, mm. and then he's just like. It's overwhelmed by <laughs> everything. And then the whole, like, are you guys Martians and everything? And it's like, oh, boy. And then he literally yeah. sees across the way Enoch with a fucking, like, sore open because of May beat the shit out of him. <laughs> and he walks up. And then Enoch says, I am not a robot. I am a... <laughs> and then if you excuse me, I have to go... <laughs> it's just, like, I love how... 
It's like, if you excuse me, I have to put more skin yeah. on my head now. It's like, yeah, I on. love that <laughs> so much. It's uh, the kind of just wonderful humor the show uses so much. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, pairing those two up with at the end and the bar and everything. And, you know, a wonderful callback to, not callback's the wrong word, I think, um, uh, reference to uh, Casablanca with uh, Koenig saying that you're not going to, uh, I think this is the beginning of a marvelous friendship. <laughs> <laughs> which is the last line in Casablanca. Um, if you've seen that movie, uh, which yeah. I recommend you should, it's great. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, of course, being the era of it is. And what's also more meta about it is that from the very beginning of this show, and when Patton Oswalt was introduced as, as, um, as Koenig, and there being so many Koenigs, then we had like three or four like siblings, um, mm-hmm. Then you also bring in LT, literally LT, <laughs> uh, Koenig, who was their sister. Um, but it's like, okay, so you – and uh, there was a running gag with with that character in the earlier seasons that he was like – I think it was a trip uh, that suspected that there were like LMDs or something, that they were like duplicates. And um, that the Koenigs – if you go back to, to S.H.I.E.L.D. history, the Koenigs – were part on the original LMD project for S.H.I.E.L.D. And, of course, you have Enoch, a Chronicom, an advanced LMD, basically, who is now, like, and then the first thing that that, that um, Koenig asks Enoch is, I want to know all about robots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, I thought that was just brilliant. It really yeah. is. And I don't know if they'll they'll build up to it or anything, but it's like, it it does like go back and like reach into the earlier years of the show and a running gag. And it was just so great. I love it. Yeah. No, that was cool. I but... wonder though, when they'll bring him back though, I hope sooner than later. I think I love Enoch. I don't know. I'm, sure I... the... I'm sure it'll be the next episode. I hope. I hope, go... I hope. I hope. A few decades. I feel like Simmons might like put out a signal or something. Be like, we're here. <laughs> right. Right. We should, Talk about the whole, um, the, why it was that Enoch was stranded in the first place. So it turns out that I was right to assume last week that, um, there was going to be a little catch to the whole, um, concept of time travel. And mm-hmm. that is, and it literally happened at the worst moment. It was so fucking annoying. And I was like, when Yo-Yo said, um, you couldn't have said this to us like earlier <laughs> when the whole damn, like out of nowhere, a fucking like time clock appears and it's counting down like 16 minutes to like, Oh, that's when we have to leave. And like, what <laughs> it really that like, came in like a late in act three of this episode. Mm-hmm. And, um, which I think also that that's a little different from a lot of other time travel shows, like especially doctor who there's no like cap on how long you can stay in one timeline, but mm-hmm. it seems to really, um, raise the stakes as it did in this episode and its climax and of course unfortunately Enoch being left behind the the uh, plot thread of basically um, having no idea when the fucking time machine is going to like all right let's go Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then we'll leave because what they said I think um, because Simmons says that like they don't have the kind of time machine where they can go wherever they want and whenever they want. It's the kind of time travel that you can only go. It's like um, the quantum realm, because in the quantum realm, the reason how they were able to manipulate that through t- and, and create time travel was because there were like particular openings in time and they can mm-hmm. like, like jump through those hoops, but yeah. only those particular hoops um, if they were there. Um, and that's kind of how the Zephyr jumps back through time is not necessarily the quantum realm, but there are particular openings in time that you can slip through, um, and get there. Um, again, a little convoluted, uh, cause I mean, time travel doesn't exist. So there's that, yeah. but, uh, yeah. What do you, what do you make of this introduction of, um, um, the time machine having a mind of its own? Uh, I think it, it it does add some tension. I I kind of hope they don't overuse it. I like know every single episode, it's just yeah. like we gotta we gotta go, we gotta go, and like you you never know who's gonna get left behind. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I mean it's a it's a interesting one. 
Really, that's all it really is. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Who fucking knows? Yeah. Um, but that's just how the the show operates a lot of these mm-hmm. times. Um, any other thoughts um, for this week's episode? Uh, I mean, I think we hit everything. We talked about Mac, uh, Yo-Yo, May a bit. Uh, do we miss anyone? <laughs> not that I can recall. No, not at this moment. Mm-hmm. No. no, I mean, like you said, it was just a part two of something that we already kind of knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. And but which uh, which I, which I would also add though that I think the um everything is enhanced if you watch like episode one and two as like one episode or one you know feature mm-hmm. presentation basically. I I wonder though, um, because you say that, um. You went to go see this at D23, the first episode of season mm-hmm. seven you watched at D23. I know they couldn't show it to you. Like it was a year ago, basically at this point, they couldn't show the second part because I would reveal, I think too much about where the season was going to go, but hell what, how much more enhanced would the experience be if they showed both episodes one and two um, for you guys at the uh, presentation? Oh my gosh! I think the anticipation for like the actual show to come out would have been a whole lot bigger because, and like we talked about, we don't know what's kind of happening with all of them. Yeah, like their psyche and all that, and you kind of want to know how it's going to get resolved. So I think the anticipation would have been a lot bigger. It would have driven me crazy to wait like nine, ten months. (laughs) Oh my god, yes. Especially with Enoch. Oh my gosh. If the fans care about Enoch the way like we do, yeah. like we would have been screaming at the end of the episode. Like Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh oh, it would have been great though. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Well, I think we're 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 done with this episode. Um mm-hmm. overall, generally positive thoughts. Um, interesting moments, um, and a lot of intrigue and mystery yet to be had. Um, but plenty of fun, and I I think mm-hmm. that's where where Shield shines bright, basically. So so far so good, and I can't wait for next week's episode, which is from our perspective, two days away. So mm-hmm. there's that. We don't got to wait as long. Um, thank you, David, for being here. Um, and thank you all for listening to this. Uh, we'll be here every single week with weekly recaps of shield here on beyond the shield on red spotlight podcast and more other shows coming your way check the feed a lot of content with the last airbender which david is also prominently featured on we had an amazing Mm -hmm. episode too which is up right now um and yeah a lot more coming your way thank you Mm -hmm. all so much stand of the spotlight bye-bye bye